Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today, we are talking about what it takes to get to AGI. This is sort of a perpetual background conversation that is interesting, I think, in two very different ways. There are, of course, all of the technical aspects of it, what it's going to take from a development standpoint to actually achieve AGI, which is something we're going to get into a bunch today. But then there's also the practical dimension of this and to what extent it actually impacts the way that you as an AI practitioner have to think about these systems today. Now, interestingly, we have comments from Google DeepMind CEO Demis Asabis that sort of span the gap between both of those. This came from the recent All In Summit, where Demis sketched out what he sees as coming in the next few years. Unsurprisingly, he is very bullish. The final question of the day was what 10 years looks like from now, and he said we'll have full AGI by then, and it will usher in a new golden era of science all of which is very exciting. And there is actually a lot to dig into around what DeepMind and Google are doing with some of the advanced science. However, that's the topic for a different show. Earlier in the interview, he had made an interesting assertion suggesting that we are very far from that goal. Let's listen to what he had to say. Some of our competitors talk about, uh, you know, these modern systems that we have today are PhD intelligences. I think that's a nonsense. They're not, they're not PhD intelligences. They have some capabilities that are PhD level. Um, but they're not in general uh, capable, uh, and, and that's what exactly what general intelligence should be, of, of performing across the board at the PhD level. In fact, as we all know, interacting with today's chatbots, if you pose the question in a certain wa- way, they can make simple mistakes with even like high school maths um, and, and simple counting. So uh, that shouldn't be possible for a true AGI system. So this is a really interesting conversation. And something that I think is lost in the nuance a little bit, Hassabas is basically taking to task the idea that AIs are PhD replacement level, because while they can do some things at that level, other things that should be trivially easy, they struggle with. This is the jagged frontier of AI capability. As you might imagine, this generated a huge amount of discussion online. Harvard professor David Sinclair, who's working on anti-aging technology, posted, Respect Demis, but disagree on this point. My lab is using a novel AI system that makes non-intuitive scientific discoveries and writes up the paper plus figures with no human intervention, easily at a PhD level. Biomedical professor Daria Anutmaz commented, I have great respect for Demis's opinions, but on this I disagree. I've trained a dozen PhD students and I can confidently claim that current state-of-the-art AI models like GPT-5 Pro operate at a much higher level. Also, even I would fail at some high school math, though I was a top math student. He could be right if he were only referring to the top 1% of PhD students who are at a super genius level. Even then, I am sure the next major updates to AI models will surpass them as well. OpenAI research scientist Aidan McLaughlin writes, Demis is of course right here. No one should fire their PhDs for GPT-5. Rather, we've democratized the experience of being a 10-year-old growing up in Cambridge who can ring random doorbells and ask experts about hologram theory or Sumerian history. Everyone gets a PhD in their pocket. So what's interesting here is that these comments cut right to the middle of this question of how much the designation of AGI matters. For the labs whose goal is this sort of generalized intelligence, it really matters, right? AI commentator Cole Trigoski writes, the ceiling capabilities are undoubtedly rising, but the floor capabilities are still lacking. Only when these floor capabilities are solved can we talk about these now mostly meaningless terms like AGI and ASI. And yet when it comes to the work we do, Obviously, if you're a business who is just trying to figure out how AI can help you, you don't need to care how AI does across a full range of tasks. You need to care how well it does across your specific task. Now, in that context, though, where the jagged frontier still matters is around just how much autonomy an AI or an agent can be given and still complete the job well. And this is the frontier that matters for the business world, as opposed to, again, some scientific definition of AGI. And yet, even if that is our measure, The frontier when it comes to autonomy for productive work tasks is jagged as well. And if that is true, given that we are looking at jagged frontiers both when it comes to generalist definitions of AGI, but also when it comes to applied autonomy, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time understanding what people think are the barriers to unlocking that next level, however we define it. Immediately following those comments about PhDs, Demis actually spoke a little bit about this. Here's what he said. 
So I think that we are maybe, you know, I would say sort of five to 10 years away um, from having uh, an AGI system that's capable of doing those things. Um, another thing that's missing is continual learning, this ability to like online teach the system something new um, or, or, some, or adjust its behavior in some way. And so a lot of these, I think, core capabilities are still missing and maybe scaling will get us there. But I feel if I was to bet, I think there are probably one or two missing breakthroughs that are still required. Um, and will come over the next uh, five five or so years. Earlier this year, podcaster Dwarkesh Patel wrote a post and released a video called Why I Don't Think AGI is Right Around the Corner. There's a lot of really valuable stuff in there. It is definitely worth checking out if you haven't yet. You can find it at dwarkesh.com. But the thing that he hones in on is exactly the thing that we just heard from Demis, which is this idea of continual learning. Dwarkesh writes, The fundamental problem is that LLMs don't get better over time the way a human would. The lack of continual learning is a huge, huge problem. The LLM baseline at many tasks might be higher than an average human's, but there's no way to give a model high-level feedback. You're stuck with the abilities you get out of the box. You can keep messing around with the system prompt. In practice, this just doesn't produce anything even close to the kind of learning and improvement that human employees experience. The reason humans are so useful is not mainly their raw intelligence. It's their ability to build up context, interrogate their own failures, and pick up small improvements and efficiencies as they practice the task. Now, from there, he talks about the various strategies that LLMs take to quote-unquote learn right now, but the point that he keeps coming back to is summed up in the sentence, it's just not a deliberative adaptive process the way human learning is. He writes, eventually the models will be able to learn on the job in the subtle organic ways that humans can. However, it's just hard for me to see how that could happen within the next few years, given that there's no obvious way to slot in online continuous learning into the kinds of models these LLMs are. Now, alongside Dwarkesh and Demis, OpenAI co-founder Andre Karpathy also sees a lack of continuous learning as a key gap for LLMs. He posted on Twitter slash X, Agree that this is an important capability hole right now. I like to explain it as LLMs are a bit like a co-worker with interrograde amnesia. They don't consolidate or build long-running knowledge or expertise once training is over, and all they have is short-term memory, the context window. It's hard to build a relationship, see 50 first dates, or do work, see memento, with this condition. The first mitigation of this deficit I saw is the memory feature in ChatGPT, which feels like a primordial crappy implementation of what could be. There might be other and better ways to do it, but I agree it feels like it needs to be in the realm of research. And there is definitely a lot of research focused on this. Rich Sutton, the author of the Bitter Lesson paper, has come up with an architecture that seems to show some promise. It's essentially a system of agents that can do reinforcement learning at runtime in the same way they can do planning before execution. Mackenzie Moorhead of Compound VC recently conducted a study of the various methods being explored today. He commented, Overall, we expect the current paradigms of base model training and inference reasoning plus memory slash rag will get us to AIs that can handle entire real-world workflows in the next few years, but we will get new primitives. Memory is an area of this question that is generating a ton of discussion as well. Last month, for example, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman said that improving memory was one of the big focuses for GPT-6. He said, people want memory. People want product features that require us to be able to understand them. There is quite obviously something fundamentally different about what AI can offer if it truly has persistent memory between sessions. It is certainly not the same or at the same level as continuous learning, but it does feel like an essential step. And even with the nascent implementations within current LLMs, you can see how big of a difference it makes. At this stage, for example, for all of my strategic planning use cases, I feel fairly locked in to ChatGPT because it has much better memory and context of everything that I've talked about with it previously. If I was to switch over to Claude or Grok, I'd have to give a ton of that background context before I could even get into whatever it is that I wanted to discuss in that particular moment. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not a voracious model switcher when it comes to other use cases. I've talked a lot about how I think that is one of the keys to getting the most out of AI right now is being model omnivorous. But it's clear that memory makes a big difference. So much so that you even have some folks, like Andrew Piganelli of the General Intelligence Company, arguing that memory is the last problem before AGI is reached. He wrote, our systems today get the interaction part right. In terms of a Turing test for interaction, we're basically all the way there. But that's only half of what's needed to make a digital self. Memory is a severely lagging interaction and the next step. Once that's solved, we'll be very close. The first AGI will be a very intelligent processor combined with a very good memory system. So how are we going to get there? One of the areas that people are looking at is coding. You might remember in an episode recently, we were talking about Cognition's big funding round and latent space creator Sean Wang's decision to move over to Cognition, he published a blog post called The Devon is in the Details and dropped this rather bold claim pretty casually. The central realization I had was this. Code AGI will be achieved in 20% of the time of full AGI and capture 80% of the value of AGI. 
This is what led him to decide to go over to Cognition full-time. Nick Pash, the head of AI at open-source coding agent Klein, took the conversation in a slightly different direction, saying, in his words, coding agent platforms have become key players in accelerating progress towards AGI. Interestingly, he kind of argues that most coding agent startups are fairly blind to their role in the AGI race. In an essay published this weekend, he described the biggest roadblock to AGI as a data starvation issue. Pash laid out that frontier model companies don't currently have access to the full picture of how developers use their platforms. They don't have access to the full code bases, they don't have repos, and critically, they don't see what happens when a user turns off the AI or switches models. He quoted one researcher who stated, We have the prompts, but we don't know what the status of the repo is. Pash wrote, One lab emphasized the urgency. If they could access this type of real-world coding data, it would be incorporated into training by the end of the night. Another described needing representative tasks at meaningful scale with authentic human preferences to build models that actually work in production. You can have well-funded frontier model labs, but without coding agent platforms collecting real-world usage data, AGI simply doesn't happen. This creates a marriage between model and application layers that most people completely miss. The application layer isn't just a business model built on top of models. It's the prerequisite for unlocking the coding capabilities that serve as humanity's speed multiplier in the race towards AGI. If you go on Twitter slash X right now and just search AGI, you can find a ton of discussion about what it's going to take. Continuous learning, memory, there are other speculations as well. And while I have argued and still believe that when it comes to businesses thinking about AI, AGI is just about the most useless term in the trough, I think that the explorations and developments on the path to AGI are useful in understanding what new types of capability and autonomy, especially when it comes to agents, get unlocked at each different development. Whether it gets us to quote-unquote AGI or not, for example, more memory and or continuous learning would have huge implications for how these systems could be deployed in the enterprise. So that's the story for today. This is obviously a very ongoing conversation. And sometimes we get these hints from labs that they have way more of an idea about how to get to AGI than they're telling us. And given that we are heading right back into the fall announcement season, maybe we'll hear about some of that in the weeks or months to come. For now, though, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching, as always. Until next time, peace.